Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion about AI-based assessments. My name is Marta Rora. I work at Red Labs. I'll be moderating this panel discussion. Well, most of us agree that we need an objective measure of education, and high-stakes summative tests have widely taken that role all across the globe. However, we have inevitably seen the summative system uh, grown eroded. Also, there have been long uh, questions about whether this method is the best tool to fairly measure one's educational performance. And all of a sudden, the coronavirus pand pandemic has paused all kinds of testing, which gives us a chance to reconsider the existing paradigm. If well implemented, AI could be an effective tool to transform this core assessment tool of the educational system. In this session, panelists will discuss how AI technology can improve educational assessment systems and discuss concerns and issues that will be important to tackle around this topic with the following question, with a number of questions that I'll ask the panel. But first, let me briefly introduce who are uh, here to discuss. So in no particular order, but we have here Andreas Schleicher, who is the Director for Education and Skills and the Head of the Programme for International Student Assessment, or PISA, at OECD. We have William G. Harris, uh, CEO of the Association of Test Publishers. Uh, we have Yigal Rosen, SVP of AI and Data Science at BrainPop. We have Alina von Davier, uh, who is Chief Assessment Officer at Duolingo and Yu Yung Lee, the Director General of Institute for Education and Innovation at in Korea. So um, I, uh, with my first question, um, I'll uh, I give the uh, opportunity for the panelists to introduce themselves <laughs> by explaining their role in assessment and how the changes in assessment, including but not limited to the implementation of AI, affect their personal work. Let me start with asking this question to Andreas first, and then we'll go around the whole uh, panel. Andreas. Thanks, Martin. <clears throat> yeah, my, I'm Director for Education and Skills at the OECD, and one of my tasks is to oversee, as you just said, you know, the Program for International Student Assessment, so our global metric to measure learning outcomes. And it's a good example where technology is profoundly changing, or our way of thinking about it, you know, uh, Technology has made our assessments so much more interactive and dynamic. Now, in the past, we used to ask students about the result of an experiment. Now we can have them do that experiment in a kind of simulated setting. So I think it's uh, certainly much more engaging. But uh, equally important, technology has made our assessments more adaptive. In the past, we would give every student exactly the same assessment. Today, we can match the assessments to the students' abilities, and it's uh, creating, you know, uh, much more engaging and relevant environments. In the past, you know, assessments would be frustratingly difficult for students who have more trouble and, you know, boringly easy for students at the top end of the distribution, and technology has allowed us to actually adapt the assessment. But uh, perhaps most interestingly, it has allowed us to assess new types of areas. We conducted our first assessment of collaborative problem solving skills, looking at the social dimension of skills, having assessing to what students can not just solve problems on their own, but can solve them together. And that would have been never uh, possible without you know, technology. But then your question was very much about AI. I think for us, it comes in on the process data. In the past, you know, we looked at whether students get the answer right or wrong in an assessment. Now we can actually track how they got to that answer and we can actually analyze those kinds of processes and they help to reveal, you know, student strategies, student thinking skills. And for pedagogy, you know, that information is perhaps even more relevant than just, you know, the degree of, of correctness. So I do think technology has opened up enormous possibilities in, in our work at the OECD. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. And let's move now to, to Alina von Davier. Uh, so what's your role in assessment and how you know, do the changes in assessment affect your work? Thank you, Martin. So I work for Duolingo. I am a chief of assessment. And in my role, I am bringing the engineering perspective and the AI perspective into a psychometric framework. So this is quite an interesting switch for me because over the 
I mean, my previous experience when I work for ACT Next and for ETS before that, I was on the psychometric side trying to bring in artificial intelligence and I introduced the concept of computational psychometrics where the two work well together. So it's quite an interesting uh, paradigm shift for me now to understand how the developers of artificial intelligence tools uh, and the way they think about assessment uh, can collaborate well with psychometricians in order to create um, reliable and valid measurements, but at the same time at scale. So the way we use artificial intelligence for the assessment is uh, from the beginning of the test development. So we develop the items using artificial intelligence and human expertise. Um, then we move through, uh, these items are moved through evaluation uh, and tagging. This tagging is done automatically again with artificial intelligence and the tagging is done in our case to uh, common European framework uh, for language because the Duolingo English test is uh, the Duolingo assessment now. And then we move forward uh, throughout the development process and apply artificial intelligence to item scoring. So what the AI managed to do for the Duolingo English test is to achieve scalability. It is an assessment that can be taken anywhere in the world at any time on any device, um, any device, still a computer, but the individual computer. And uh, in order to have that flexibility, you have to have technology that supports it. So we are very proud about the opportunities for access that Duolingo provided for all English uh, learners uh, all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. And G, how about you in, in, in your position? Martin, thank you. Um, I'm not in the research or test development, but I, I'm the CEO of a global trade association for the test publishing community. And it's clear that as, as has already been mentioned, the entire assessment process from design, development, delivery, scoring, reporting, the entire process ha has been um, influenced and is being transferred in, in an AI direction. Um, so for us, you know, we, we have the educational certification licensure, uh, training and development, hiring, even the um, psychological examinations are being given a AI treatment. Well, AI is, is changing um, how tests are developed. It's also basically affecting the way AI um, or how tests are delivered. And so we're seeing AI uh, used for authentication, for remote proctoring, for video surveillance, as well as for detection of uh, irregularities during the testing period. Um, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that AI impacts people. And given that it's ubiquitous, uh, it, it has to be uh, sent through a very high stress test to make sure that um, as these models become uh, practical and applied, that the data is not shifting um, and that there's not under, rep, under specification as the model goes from the lab to, to application. Um, we're, we're interested in, in this whole area, which means that because it impacts people, regulatory efforts are well underway. For instance, the European A, uh, AI regulation proposal uh, has been put forth. And there's also one from the US uh, uh, in terms of trying to regulate and control uh, the use of, of AI. In both cases, they encompass the use of high stakes exams in the educational environment. One of the things that we see happening and one of the things that the association is, is very encouraged about is that AI has the potential of making learning opportunities more accessible to those who have different able, who are differently abled. And this is an important part of, of, one of, it, of the a ATP mission is trying to make sure that uh, all learners have access to high quality assessments and education. Thank you. Thank you, G. And he Yoon, uh, would you like to answer this question? Hi, my name is He Dong, He Dong Lee. I'm currently Director General of Institute for Education and Innovation in Korea. 
and former research professor at Seoul National University in Korea. Uh, I think I'm taking the role of sharing my experience in Korean context in this section. I got a PhD in educational technology, education method at Seoul National University in 2004 and taught how to teach and learn better for more than 12 years at SNU. Uh, as a research professor of the Center for Teaching and Learning at SNU, I was supposed to help other professors teaching and other students learning to, to improve their teaching and learning quality. But as time went on, I found that teaching and learning quality is not only the matter of instructional design in the individual level or in the level of individual course, but there are many other factors such as assessment paradigm of the education institu institution or like a national curriculum, et cetera. So since then, I started to believe that the teaching and learning quality, instructional design, instructional technology, those are all critically related to, related to what is assessed in the end. So I hope to share my experience with education technology and assessment in this session today. Thank you, Ejun. And uh, Igal, uh, how about you? Thank you, Martin. Uh, Igal Rosen, I'm leading the uh, assessment design, AI, and data science work at BrainPop, and also uh, with ACT leading the development of the PISA 22, uh, 2022 uh, creative thinking assessment. Uh, so I will speak more uh, from the say, teacher perspective and the integrated learning assessment uh, systems in that context. Um, so as a former physics and computer science teacher, uh, I think that the major advancements in AI need to really be designed in service of uh, teachers and students in the best way possible. Uh, at BrainPop, we are developing the capabilities to basically power all the uh, learning and assessment uh, products, offerings, uh, with uh, mastery tracing capabilities, uh, recommender capabilities, but also to help teachers to better evaluate um, open-ended responses from students. Uh, so construct response uh, type of questions uh, in science, how you uh, provide your, demonstrate your ability to claim uh, with uh, supporting evidence uh, or math uh, reasoning or argumentation, and of course in uh, languages, how you uh, show your cre critical thinking or creative thinking. So these capabilities really help us to not only trace mastery and pinpoint what exactly students are uh, great at and where they're struggling, but also to provide um, really uh, the, the best uh, recommender pathways for teachers to be able to evaluate and assign uh, to their students. Uh, so this is more of an integration of learning and assessment in the PISA world and Andreas uh, mentioned that in part, uh, these capabilities uh, helped us in 2015 to design some of those assessments for collaborative problem solving skills that were very challenging to uh, measure without having those capabilities. And currently, of course, for the assessment of creative thinking, we are also using some of those capabilities uh, more on the uh, process data, how we can distinguish between, for example, responses that are uh, high, higher uh, on the higher originality level versus uh, uh, a lower, you know, creative creativity originality level. So these capabilities are embedded to really enable us not only to teach better and support uh, students with uh, better learning pathways, but also to um, measure and provide insights, actionable insights on skills that we were unable to do before. Okay, thank you, Yigal. So now we know a bit, bit more about uh, the panelists' backgrounds and. Um, the next question I'd like to, to hear the, the panel's opinion on, now what are the biggest challenges that we face in the field of assessment? Uh, and I'd like to start with Hei Jung. Okay, um, one of the challenges is that there are discrepancies between the education goals of the assessments and the final outcomes of the assessments. I started to be aware of this problem in the assessment paradigm from my research that I've done at Seoul National University. I try to find out the study skills and learning strategies of high achievers at the top university in Korea, which were published in several journals as a series of articles later. They were all integrated and published as a book titled 
who gets an A plus at Seoul National University. This research, identifying critical GPA factors at a top university in Korea, revealed the serious problems in current Korean education and suggested education paradigm shift by assessment to innovation. This book said that the education will not change if the assessments in the end are not changed. The research is this. In order to find out what the GPA factors are at SNU, first, we interviewed 46 high achievers whose GPA is higher than 4.0 out of 4.3. They're mostly like A plus students. In order, in addition to this qualitative analysis, we also conducted a quantitative analysis from 1,111 undergrad students across all majors at SNU. One significant finding was that the receptive learners who only received knowledge without any critical or creative thinking were more likely to have higher GPA compared to critical or creative learners. The most significant GPA factor at SNU was shockingly writing down every single word that the professor said. 87% of high achievers across all majors, the notes they took were not keywords or summaries, but were literally everything, word for word, even the instructor's jokes and body language. Based on this interview result, we surveyed over a thousand undergrad students at SNU and confirmed that there was a significant correlation between GPA and a type of study skill we categorized as a receptive learning skill. This is not the achievement that we want to foster. We cannot call this a success in this era. Universities' outcomes are not aligned with their educational missions and goals. I believe the reason for this unintended outcome is because these competencies that we want to raise, like the four C's, are not properly assessed within the course. There are discrepancies between the educational goals of the assessment and the final outcomes of the assessment. But there is no institu institutional system to monitor these discrepancies to minimize the gaps. Oh, thank you. That is very interesting uh, to to hear the situation in Korea. So who else would like to talk about the challenges that we face in the field of assessment? I actually agree with Si Young. I think the biggest challenge is that the things that are easiest to test have also become easiest to digitize, to automate, and they're just disappearing. I think it's the validity challenge. But I'd like to add uh, and, and, and also, I mean, related to this, we tend to sort of sacrifice validity gains for efficiency gains in education, uh, and we often sacrifice, you know, relevance for reliability. You know, we want assessments that are non-contestable, and then we give up on the things that actually, you know, make a difference. I, I, so I agree with, with her that these are big challenges, but let me add one, and I think that is, you know, the... Over the last few centuries, essentially, we divorced assessment from learning. You know, if you actually go far back in education, uh, learning and assessment were always two sides of the same coin. You had a kind of apprenticeship philosophy methodology where learners and assessors would always be in close collaboration. And when we industrialized uh, teaching and learning and industrialized assessment, we sort of separated the two, the two. You know, we have students pile up, you know, lots and lots and lots of learning. And then one day we asked them, you know, come back and tell me everything in a very artificial, contrived and constrained environment. And then, you know, we, we, we wonder why people get very anxious and very nervous. And uh, I, I think again, you know, I believe that the power of technology lies in reintegrating assessment and learning again. You know, I think we now have the possibility to overcome that separation by giving learners more immediate feedback on while they are learning and giving teachers better data on how different students learn differently. So I think <clears throat> for me, that is one of the most fundamental challenges in assessment. And actually it's one that the pandemic really exposed. You know, why did our uh, assessment systems collapse during the pandemic? Not because students didn't learn, but because we had our methods were not you know, good at actually observing how students learn. And, I, I really think that's a stark reminder that uh, we really need to rethink that model. 
Yeah, I think that I agree. The pandemic uh, showed us the, the weaknesses of the system. And I think, uh, Alina, you wanted to say something as well. <coughs> no, good points. And I agree with both uh, the perspectives from He Jung Lee and from Andrea Schleicher. Thank you. I, I didn't think about that, He Jung. So, um, I, from my perspective, another challenge is the level of uh, how conservative we are in education. We tend to be very afraid of introducing changing, uh, changes. And at the same time, we are very um, slow, I would say, in uh, adopting and teaching new methodologies in the educational system for test developers, psychometricians, and policy makers. So on one side, we have artificial intelligence tools that are quite sophisticated and require um, their own, you know, like any other paradigm, scientific paradigm require one to really uh, immerse uh, themselves uh, into it and understand it. And then we have a well-established uh, system with assessment that are in some cases, 60 years old. Um, and they are still kind of successful. So oh, you can imagine that there is a, con a conflict here that involves financial conflict, involves, uh, uh, you know, uh, attitude, involves uh, personal interest even, uh, that create a difficulty for adoption of tools that could in principle make everything better, but they seem to be very scary at the moment. So I also think that uh, one approach that, and perhaps it's our responsibility here, our as a community, is to help the community understand what exactly all of these AI tools are, where the risks are, because they are not riskier than anything else we've done before. They are just different. So the more we manage to, uh, um, to teach perhaps uh, the teachers, but I mean here more on terms of uh, professors even and, uh, and psychologists and psychometricians, uh, perhaps the better we would be and the faster we would be in having some of these transitions uh, implemented. Thank you, Alina. And who, who else would like to come at G? Yeah. yeah, in many ways, I, I agree with Andreas and, and uh, Alina that um, we're still basically, when it comes down to education, we're still in the second industrial revolution uh, in many ways. And then as, as, as you move forward, um, what happened in terms of the, the artificial separation of, of assessment and, and learning is, is as, as Alina implied, economics. Um, and if you look at with, within the United States, there's actually legislation that says at the state level that says very clearly that if you provide the assessment, you cannot provide the content. And, and therefore you create two economic opportunities there. And, and that's across the board in terms of the United States. Now, now that we've moved into a, uh, a totally digitized environment, a very digitized environment, uh, one of the things that becomes very clear is that uh, the late adopters within the educational environment, which pretty much is, is all, um, have been compelled by COVID to um, rethink. Now the question is, how far through, through this process of rethinking will they go? Will they actually change and realize that perhaps the whole idea of standardized assessment is no longer a relevant point of, of, of contact between the student and knowledge? It's a really great observation. I would just add, uh, uh, you know, from the uh, educational standards standpoint, uh, right? So it's really all about accountability and what, you know, teachers in the U.S. school districts are expected to, uh, to be able to show, you know, toward the end of the year, right? That can be measured through somebody of assessment. I think there is a question mark that this panel is raising to that uh, strategy. Uh, but really it's about, first of all, the standards themselves. So a good example will be, uh, you know, the, again, U.S. example, uh, next generation science standards, right? So the standards themselves are uh, three-dimensional. So it's, uh, you know, if you look into the, uh, you know, the core disciplinary ideas, right, which is really the classical way to teach science, right? So this is just one dimension. The other two dimensions are really about cross-cutting capabilities and the scientific and engineering principles that uh, students need to apply in order to, you know, to reach mastery. So it starts, I would say, accountability-wise, of course, in you know, economics, but also the standards themselves. Uh, when standards become more multidimensional, 
uh, adding those skill sets that uh, we just mentioned, right? The reasoning, critical thinking, you know, creativity. So then basically it becomes part of what is expected, uh, performance expectations, uh, you know, for, for each grade level, uh, for the school districts to be able to show. And then the, the uh, learning itself, right? The, from a pedagogical standpoint, you know, you can see, you can start to see changes. It's not something that you can see changing, you know, overnight, but over you know, years, you will see uh, changes. So it changes the way teachers, you know, science teachers teach. It changes the way the learning systems need to provide those, you know, learning experience that, that build mastery across all the three dimensions, you know, just the core uh, disciplinary areas, right? And then you have to, sh to be able to show, to, to provide teachers with insights as students interact with those uh, learning activities. So it's no longer about just summative assessment. It's even no longer about benchmarking assessment, you know, two, three, four times in a year. Uh, it's really about, um, you know, pretty much daily uh, ability to, for students to build their knowledge, build their mastery, and for the, this learning, integrated learning systems to be able to provide teachers uh, with the greater insights across all the dimensions, not just about, you know, biology, physics, it's really, or the, you know, this discipline knowledge, it's really about this additional dimension, such as, you know, how they uh, show their scientific reasoning, how they provide um, claims with uh, supporting evidence, uh, to what extent students can communicate and work together in order to, um, you know, to solve a, a, a complex uh, scientific challenge. So those, when standards are, are changing, when the performance expectations are changing, then it, it is the kind of essential driver for those uh, innovations in the way teachers teach and in the way students uh, or learners, uh, uh, you know, build those mastery levels as they go through different grade levels. Of course, it also challenges in a way this grade leveling concept as well, because it is uh, not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, feasible just to, uh, you know, land on just one specific grade where, you know, all the three dimensional need to be covered. It's really much more of a, a learning trajectory, uh, you know, where, where, you, where you show how basically students can develop mastery across those three dimensions uh, across different grade, grade areas. And in many cases, students work together in teams, uh, uh, really across different grades. So it builds that capacity that uh, back to, I think the, uh, the initial briefing for this, for this session, can build these differentiators compared to just AI, more of a, you know, routine capabilities that usually uh, can be achieved very you know, effective, very efficiently uh, with AI. So, so Yigal, when I listen to you, so could you describe to me what, what you would see as the, you know, the, from, from an educational perspective would be the ideal uh, assessment? What would the ideal assessment look like? There have been tons of research articles about learning effectiveness in education and technology. Um, research on learning effectiveness has shown that in general, there is no significant difference between online and offline learning. What matters is how to design the instruction itself. But instructional design should be differentiated by the nature of learning. For example, in receptive learning, self-learning mode with well-structured materials has almost the same learning effect as highly interactive learning with little materials. This implies that it would be better to spend the budget for developing well-structured materials for self-learning in the areas of receptive learning for both cost effectiveness and learning effectiveness. However, in critical and creative learning, self-learning mode with well-structured materials cannot reach the learning effect of highly interactive learning with little, little, little materials. This means that in critical creative learning, interaction, human interaction matters the most, implying that we don't have to waste our budget that much for developing materials in this kind of learning. Rather, we should spend the budget for recruiting more instructors and tutors to interact with students for critical and creative learning. So the receptive learning area, which needs understanding and remembering to be designed with learning analytics, AI-based adaptive learning system, which is high tech in this conference, and critical creative learning area, which require, require applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating, should be designed in a highly interactive and constructive way so that students can engage 
in active learning, which is high touch in this conference game. I, if I if I may just add, I actually agree with Egard's uh, you know broad lines of assessment, and I actually do think that they extend pretty well also to what we should expect from from large scale assessment. You know, and uh, in a way, we 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 should you know we can drop you know this word uh, standardized assessment and call it more comparative assessment because the standardization was a you know a practicality issue, whereas the comparative is the purpose issue, and I do think. Many of the attributes that Igal mentioned, I think, apply very well to the comparative assessment. But I'd, I add a couple of more. You know, I think one one important test that we should be making to an assessment is: is it going to take time away from learning, or is it going to add to the learning process? You know, and I think that needs to be real and perceived like this. Uh, second test I would apply: you know, will it help to expand the curriculum you know test the boundaries of the curriculum or just you know be the lowest common denominator of the of the curriculum i think too much of our current assessment is very kind of reductive uh, but i do believe that assessment actually has the potential to get students you know pushing the boundaries around the curriculum and actually extend you know their ways of thinking and their ways of of working uh, i also you know a third aspect i would add you know a good assessment should be you know, as much as possible invisible to the learner, but uh, make the invisible visible, you know, in a sense that it gives, you know, students and teachers better tools to see uh, uh, things. And um, that also, you know, I think uh, it, we need to have better feedback at multiple levels. It's not just a learner. I think, of course, as a learner, you want to, you know, discover your strengths and weaknesses, what gets you interested, what makes you bored, where you're good at, where you can advance. And I think that's the easy part of AI, but also given that we are in education settings, we need to develop better feedback for educators so that they understand how different students learn differently and can engage more productively uh, with, with pedagogy. And I think that's something, <clears throat> as long as we work in large group settings, where we can make so much more progress, you know, where the kind of issue of learning analytics uh, really comes in. And I, I believe the same is true at the system level. Uh, we need to understand much better why certain educational settings are so much more productive than than others if we want to, you know, improve, uh, you know, the efficiency and effectiveness of education overall. And that brings me to a last point, you know, often there is a negative connotation of, you know, people say, well, high stakes is not so great. Actually, you know, I, do, I believe the stakes of the assessment are really, really important. We should just make them real and productive. You know, there should be stakes in the assessment. You know, as a student, it should have, you know, make you rethink your approaches to learning. As a teacher, it should make you, you know, uh, review your, you know, view of, of that student. So I think we should, you know, not lower the stakes of the assessment, but make them more relevant and, and productive for, for improvement purposes. No? Yeah, great point, Andreas. Thank you. Um, so, Alina. Uh, I would like to add only one thing that I haven't heard being uh, explicitly <laughs> discussed, but implicitly it was uh, brought both by Hejang and Andreas. Uh, it's the issue of design. Uh, so, and what I mean by that is for the improvement of uh, the user test taker experience. For example, for a high stake assessment, we, we know how, um, how uh, anxiety provoking those can be for many students. And as Andrea said, we still believe that the high stakes should stay uh, for different purposes within this universe of assessments. So the question for us is how can we improve the experience of test takers within these conditions of high stakes. And again, I think that's another area where AI can help in, and, but also the, the concept of design uh, and what is really needed for a student to, to display. How do you design the items that you get, the optimal evidence uh, of that particular skill you are trying to measure and that you only give as many items as are needed as opposed to keeping the test taker uh, for a very long time in that uh, stressful environment. So I, I believe that this is another area where the ideal assessment can help. And so the, the user test taker experience flow and the design of it and improvement of it. Thank you. Yeah, so, so Alina, to, to go a bit further on that. So uh, when, when you take these, uh, these, um, these comments and look a bit 
deeper into the role of AI in this. Can you can you talk a bit more about how you see the role of AI in the, for the ideal assessment? Uh, so for high stakes, and I will stay with the high stakes as exams that report score at the individual level first, uh, because that's where I am uh, working at the moment with Duolingo. So I, as I said, I see the role of AI in uh, democratizing the assessment, making the assessment accessible to people so that on top of having a high stake uh, test to take and be anxious about how you are gonna do that you don't need to add additional costs, finding a test center, traveling to a test center. So all of that is actually achieved with a very powerful uh, technology that, uh, platform for test delivery that can work all over the world uh, and at any time. Uh, that also involves appropriate type of proctoring with human proctors that speak the local languages and so on. So it's a full system where AI plays an important role, but it's not the only one. Another area is in order to create all of this, especially on a very tight timeline, like we, as I said, we deliver the test um, anytime, anywhere, and the score reports are ready in, on average in about 36 hours. Well, in order to get to that speed, again, we take full advantage of what the machines can do, and we take full advantage of what the, where the humans are needed. So that combination is, uh, again, a very uh, powerful instrument for creating assessments that are accessible for to people and then the other area that I think it's quite relevant is the development of content by having the uh, by mastering and we are still working on that I'm not saying we solve all the problems here but by mastering uh, the modeling of content according to the purposes we want, including complex tasks such as simulations or, or perhaps even games that could be included in some assessment. So by mastering those features, we can actually expand the way in which assessment are conducted because one problem again to uh, acknowledging or including simulation-based assessment uh, task in the assessment is uh, financial. It's extremely um, almost cross prohibited to have games for sure. Uh, simulations are a bit easier to integrate, but in general, generally speaking, those require so many uh, pilots and iterations that often make it extremely difficult to uh, instantiate. But I believe that if we figure out how to harness the AI power to align different tasks and different contents to different levels, not only difficulty, but as Egal pointed out to different dimensions, uh, then uh, we could also uh, build the new type of uh, assessment for multiple purposes, including for high stakes. So actually I am, I'm a strong believer that list uh, simulation like task can be part uh, of high stake assessment. Uh, of course, there is still work to be done here, uh, and we do, uh, we are working on it, but uh, I, I'm very optimistic, actually. I think, uh, I think we will manage to uh, make this transition. It might not happen uh, everywhere. It might happen more into new assessment uh, on some, some changes on the fringe, as always, when innovation takes place, uh, but I believe it's, uh, it's already happening, so I, I see this transition. Anyone else on the uh, the role of AI in assessments? Well, from from my standpoint, um, Martin, um, the the real critical issue is how far down into the educational stream can can we go? Can we go to to the middle schools um, and and senior high school and really develop the kind of AI systems that are not only seamless but um, they 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 travel with the student like a blockchain technology ledger or ledger where we're able to understand this particular student's um, growth, educational growth, learning growth, and, and prepare the student to be, to be able to sit and take effectively and successfully a high stakes exam. The problem is, is not the high stake exam, it's the problem that, that many young uh, learners are not equipped and prepared to take uh, um, uh, 
an exam that will affect their, their life uh, pathway. And so AI and assessment, assessment and, and learning, I, I agree with everyone that it has to be integrated and it has to be real-time feedback. It has to have relevant interventions to help you know, a student learn um, you know, the fundamental theorem of calculus you know, rather than just understanding it in some superficial way. I mean, it, it, has to be, it has to be able to go deep. It has to be able to, to measure that on a regular basis so that it becomes, it, it becomes um, solidified in terms of the person's understanding. But high stakes exams are not the problem. High stakes exams uh, could, it all, all students could benefit from high stakes exam because it's part of building your character. It's part of building who you are as a person. It, it's part of showing how motivated you are to go to the next step. So I, I, I totally endorse all that, but there needs to be a way to prepare students well before they sit and take a tutorial for two, three, four weeks. It has to go into the middle schools. It has to go into the senior high school. And it has to be more than just preparing for a test. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, I I agree with you know Alina and and Jay. I think the you know capacity of AI to dramatically increase the both the authenticity and also the validity of the assessment processes. I think we are just scratching the surface, but I do think we will see huge kind of changes there. But I would also think you know the. Analysis and interpretation is an area where I think we are just at the very beginning. You know, if you if you're a teacher in the classroom, you know, probably you just get one percent of what's going on in this classroom through your eyes and ears, now, or maybe zero point one percent. I don't know. I do think you know with with sensors and uh, uh, technology, I think AI can help us. You know, make sense so much more systematically of what goes on in terms of learning processes, and then you know give teachers a better understanding of themselves, maybe their own, you know, uh, biases and views on on the classroom. So I think this kind of analysis and interpretation is an area where I do believe AI has a huge kind of potential. And then, you know, G just made, mentioned one point, you know, that I think we also have not yet on our radar screen fully, and that is actually blockchain. Now, by building a kind of currency of assessment, then we could give learners so much more agency over what they learn and how they learn and when they learn and where they learn you know today people have to follow all these scripts and then they have to go through all these uh, gateways of excess assessment and exams simply because we have no way to follow their learning in a more kind of personal and individual way and i do think current uh, blockchain will allow us to build more of a currency and will hopefully you know help us unbundle educational content delivery and accreditation you know universities extract huge monopoly rent simply because you know they sell expensive accreditation and actually you know i think the next generation of assessments will put, put that to the test you know things like micro credentialing things like you know uh and and, and I, I i do think you know ai should re help us revolutionize that component as well Great uh, that you mentioned the blockchain, uh, Andreas. I'm actually working on a blockchain project right now. So, uh, but uh, but let's let's stay with the AI. Uh, anyone else would like to comment on the um, the role of AI in assessment? Sure, I, I would love to add more. So, I think really, these are great observations. You know, one area uh, we are working on at uh, BrainPop, and you know, I'm sure. Uh, other uh, organizations, really how we extend the range of, uh, uh, you know, evidence we have for students making progress, you know, in what they know and can do. And uh, one re really interesting area where AI is really, you know, powerful and there is a promising, some promising results and prototypes is really uh, the, the related to artifacts students can submit and how we can help teachers and instructors, facilitators to gain insights um, and basically reduce the workload, right? So we know that teachers uh, will uh, usually uh, try to limit the, uh, you know, the, the range of artifacts students are going to uh, create and share and submit <coughs> evaluation just because it's very laborious. It's very significant in terms of being able to, you know, review uh, 30 of those. So if you, if you teach more than one class, so it just, uh, you know, will grow exponentially. So basically one area is how we can help teachers to gain 
more insights in this AI hybrid mode from, for example, submission of uh, videos by students. So it's assuming that it's a, you know, up to one minute video and you need to, you know, explain a certain phenomena, your understanding of the phenomena, or uh, you're working on the team and you need to submit your summary as a team, right? Uh, or artifacts uh, such as just images. So you're creating a, a drawing to just, you know, explain your new concept for the engineering project you have uh, in the high school. So, uh, you know, drawings, videos, uh, uh, mind mapping, the concept mapping, you know, any, uh, anything that goes beyond just the basic item types that we are so used to, multiple choice, or open response or drag and drop, basically artifacts. So this is the area where AI can help very significantly. And we reached the point where even this multi-dimensional uh, scoring or insights we are going to, we want to provide to teachers reach the point with the AI capabilities that we need, uh, you know, even for say supervised, uh, you know, ML algorithms to just have 50 uh, examples of those artifacts scored by trained teachers or you know human um, scores to be able to train the AI to be able to do that for <laughs> teachers, right? So we can of course optimize as we go, but it really at this point uh, with the capabilities or so AI ML algorithm capabilities, we don't need that many <laughs> to be able to train the engine to train these algorithms and be able to provide the the insights even on significant uh, uh, significantly complex concepts uh, such as uh, you know scientific reasoning or uh, uh, you know communication collaboration skills so this is i think really interesting area for advancement and of course it is very little what andreas mentioned as interpretation how we make this uh, insights actionable for teachers right so it's all about building the right um, uh, you know setup where it's not only feasible and possible to you know gain, gain those insights from this uh, um, artifacts you can submit by using AI, but also how we make that really actionable, insightful for teachers to act on. So this is the area I think that will require uh, more significant work than uh, the, the more of a technical side of being able to do that. So this is where we're really focusing on in BrainPop and in many other organizations that try to basically lead the way in that uh, vein of how we help teachers to extend the capabilities to review work done by students beyond just the basic, uh, you know, item types uh, that we are so used to. Okay, so now let's uh, kick off the final question for the panel, and I'd like to start with G. Uh, so this whole, you know, paradigm shift. How do you think it will affect the assessment and learning industry? Well, um, I'm going to focus largely on standardized admission tests for um, admission into uh, four-year undergraduate programs in the U.S. Um, because if there's one area that has been totally disrupted by uh, COVID, it's been standardized admission tests, as well as the standardized admission decision process itself. <coughs> um, this, if, if, if the signals coming from the market are accurate, um, um, we are not going to return to a, a pre-COVID era in terms of, of standardized exams. The test optional um, movement has basically climbed to about 1,500 universities in the United States. That means you can submit your test standardized exam results or you can um, not submit your results. Um, that number was already climbing well over 1,000 before uh, COVID. So it's it's probably it's probably around for for uh, some time, but it's it's a temporary solution. It's not a final solution, nor is test blind uh, uh, option uh, uh, a a valid solution as well. And neither one of these, in terms of test option or or test blind, is going to change the uh, the formula or change the. The, the calculus around um, uh, diversity and, and inclusion. It won't happen. Um, ultimately, and, and this is always a political issue, the quality of the education uh, for across the entire social economic um, stratum is what's going to make a big difference in the long run. That may not never happen. But, but, but just as a quote, back in, in, the, in the 20th century, a famous uh, scientist, uh, social scientist by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois said very clearly that the 21st century will be the period of access. 
access to resources. And we're seeing that very clearly. So rethinking uh, the relationship between learning and assessment, we know very clearly that during the, the COVID situation, we had over 207 million online learners. That number will, will change to about 417, double, but by, by 2030. So digital learning um, is reaching all aspects of, of the educational system. So, you know, it, it's hard to say the age of digital learning without saying it's also the age of digital assessment. All right, the, the two are so inter, interwoven. And I think um, the work that at BrainPop is a clear example of the integration that has to occur. Um, but one of the things that, that strikes me um, is the fact that um, um, we have to demonstrate that we can actually do better than what we're doing today. I mean, it's just like, it's just like a, um, you know, looking at an um, experiment and, and saying that this is much better than what we've been doing. You have to prove it empirically. And you have to improve it in a way that shows that the cost is worth the investment. And, and so I, I believe that um, we have to do a lot of work in, in demonstrating the validity, the reliability, the psychometric underpinnings of the AI system going forward. And if we do that, then we have to fight the level of acceptance among stakeholders. As Alina and others have said, um, uh, education is conservative. And, and, and um, we have to be able to show without any hesitation that AI is going to make a significant difference. And we have to be careful that um, we don't, and this was also mentioned, that we don't forget the fact that students have to interact. They have to develop socially. They have to be engaged with other peers and, 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 and teachers. And so in, in some ways, when we look at AI, we're also looking at what others have called augmented intelligence. It augments uh, what teachers can do and what teachers can, uh, because they don't have the resources or the time or the capability. So, you know, I totally agree with what's been said is that we have to bring AI and, and, and the teachers together in a way that is compatible, supportable, and, and, and something that will um, overcome any type of resistance. And also on the effects on the industry. Well, the effects on the industry, is, you want me to respond to that? Or do you want somebody else? I'm more than happy. Yeah. Well, the, from, the, from the standpoint, um, you know, I have the, um, the, I'm not sure if it's the fortune, the good fortune or not, but all of the major standardized emission exam companies have have, have come to ATP and asked me to find a solution to the current problem, uh, which is somewhat of a, um, a mountain of a task. But the, 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 the issue is um, high tech organizations, unfortunately, are going to um, uh, have the opportunity to solve the, the current disruption. I don't see that the, the conventional standardized exam test publishers have the, the speed uh, to, to move at, at the pace that needs to be um, um, used. And so I think you'll, you'll find high tech organizations coming into this market um, uh, and providing solutions. The question is the level of acceptance. You're looking at right now with the online um, uh, learning uh, environment of $1 trillion in terms of, of, of expecting income over, over the next you know, few years. It's a huge market and, and unfortunately, um, conventional thinking has to change. And I don't see that moving at, at, at the speed that is going to um, not allow new entries into the market. It's never been a time in the history of standardized exams where the barriers to entry is so low. And so um, uh, the opportunity is so great for those who are outside of, of the traditional market. You know, I, gee, I, I, I agree with this in part from a technical perspective, but I, I guess, you know, that will only come true if public policy does its homework, you know. At the moment, you have low barriers of entry, but you have a highly fragmented and atomized market, basically, you know, uh, basically, 
uh, schools, you know, make different procurement decisions or districts. So, you know, and because they make different decisions, nobody can put the data together. And what often happens is, you know, you, you load all of that on school leaders. You know, you deal with the issues of data security, you deal with issues of technology, you deal with issues of assessment. And then, you know, their reaction is, I don't touch this. And then, you know, nothing happens. And that's, you know, why I think we, we, we really, I think, uh, need to think harder about public policy. And I would even add one more aspect to this, and this is resources. You know, there is a clear imbalance between the investment that we make in learning and the investment that we make in figuring out to what extent that learning has been effective. You know, if I feel sick and, you know, I need to do a brain scan or, you know, a CT of my, my stomach, you know, people have, you know, every understanding that this is going to cost, you know, maybe 500, maybe a thousand, maybe $5,000. We are ready to, you know, invest in the diagnostics. In the field of education, we have really sacrificed validity gains for efficiency gains. We want to do things cheaply. We're not willing to make those necessary investments. And I think that's severely compromising, not just the quality of assessment, but also the value proposition for, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and, and innovators in this field. <clears throat> Andreas, you're absolutely right. In, in the US, you have 50 different um, um, markets and with, with 50 different approaches because you know, it's such a politically um, driven kind of um, approach to education. And unfortunately, uh, that has to change too. I agree. So, so I really like both uh, converse, points of conversations. I think they are uh, all valid. Um, there is something that G said that stuck with me and, um, and probably I'm uh, overreacting here, G, so bear with me. But I heard you saying that first AI should prove itself in terms of validity, reliability, and so on. And then we are gonna try to have it accepted. And I would like to raise a flag here because AI is not one thing. AI is a collection of tools. And as such, no tool is useful for everything. So there will always be situations where a particular AI is not valid for some use, actually a lot of uses, but nevertheless, it can be very valuable for very specific uses. So I would be a bit concerned because then it become easily um, an issue to be manipulated or used by those who don't want any changes, you know, yeah. oh, didn't prove itself in all of this application, therefore it must be dangerous or we, we might need to reconsider. So I would, I would be a bit more careful with that. Another point I want to make, but in the same context is that the current methodologies that we have are not perfect and they are not also, they are not useful in all applications. They are not valid in all applications. Sometimes we yet still consider them just because we got used to them. So I just want to make sure that we are on the same page that yes, of course we want uh, a show a proof of uh, usefulness and validity uh, for the application at hand, whatever it is proposed. Yeah. I would not necessarily make it a, uh, um, a condition for being accepted. So because it's, it's just a tool. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's my I, point. I agree, in fact, when, when I was referencing that, referencing it in terms of the specificity, I mean, for, for a particular use, I mean, if you look at the AI regulations that are, are being proposed by the EU, conformity assessment relates to the particular use within a, a, a given market or a given um, industry. And you have to do post-market assessment as well, once it's in place. But, in, in, you know, so that you can ensure that you're not amplifying, amplifying biases. So I agree with you completely that, you know, for just like a, you know, a, a, a traditional test, you have to validate it and, and, and do all the necessary psychometric uh, uh, st studies to make sure that it's, it's valid for that particular setting and for that particular purpose. So I, I agree completely, completely with that. Um, but it, it's, it's going to be, even if, if you think back when online exams first came out in the late 70s, early 80s, you had to prove that you had sufficient validity and reliability data to show its, its uh, generalizability across different clinics or different uh, hiring uh, uh, sites and so forth. It, it's no different in, in terms of that. 
So Alina has a great point. I, I would I would even like building on that point, just extending. Uh, I think uh, you know the classical kind of uh, in acceptance criteria for assessment, as we all know in the summative assessments, of course mentioned here, validity, reliability, and a few more down the line. Uh, you know we are adding a significant dimension when it comes to this. Uh, Kind of integrated systems and especially powered by AI in support of you know teachers and learners and this is really to what extent you know the insights we are gaining from those assessments especially AI driven assessments can effectively drive learning so this part was I would say very much uh, underestimated as a one of the criteria, you know, criteria basically for you know, like very reliable assessment, accessible and fair. It's really this effectiveness. So uh, we see uh, basically the, and a, you know, we see a trend right now where we can, um, with the AI algorithms, basically we can optimize the algorithm on the fly, right? So what we are doing usually is basically that we are testing initial you know, case with say five, six, seven different algorithms and, and basically select the one that is performing the best for the use case, where, for the purpose we're looking at. And then we can basically optimize, not just based on more data that we're getting from students, but also based on performance. And we can you know, change the algorithm itself to perform, to reach high performance, measured not only by greater reliability and fairness and accessibility, but also by effectiveness to drive skill development, right? So this is an important part that I think was pretty much like missing or at least underestimated in the you know, classical theory of you know, what needs to be, uh, what, what can be considered as a, as a you know, high quality assessment in the summative space where basically we transition to this uh, more formative assessments, uh, you know, working hand in hand as part of this uh, integrated learning system, really the ability to drive learning, to, to drive, uh, a, effective deeper learning and also make optimizations on the fly without this significant uh, you know block that basically required by more uh, you know say conventional assessments where basically nothing can really be optimized <laughs> like you're getting the results at the end of the uh, school year basically nothing teachers can cannot really make much uh, based on those uh, much adaptations or much uh, you know benefit for the students with those assessments and Nothing can be really optimized uh, on the fly, like we see with the with the AI capabilities. Still, the uh, you know the question, the effort on the interpretability uh, and uh, you know friendliness <laughs> in supporting teachers and in, in, in instructional decisions remains right. So this part is, needs to be really uh, uh, you know advanced. But I would I would add that component that is really uh, I think uh, one of the underlying principles that I see in the advancement or role of AI in assessment and learning. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Nicole. So, yeah. so now the uh, the final comment will come from Hei Jun. Yeah. Uh, after that, I'll cl close up the discussion. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Let me add about um, assessment regulation on Paula's part. In order to take the role of AI properly, sometimes we need to revise assessment rules and policies of national curriculum. Maybe uh, this may not be the case of other countries, but only in Korea, though. But, um, Currently at Seoul National University, I'm involved in a project to propose a new assessment model for college entrance exam and K-12 school exams. There are many suggestions and innovation agenda, but let me share one of them here. In Korea, college entrance exam is relative normative evaluation with 100% multiple choice questions in all subjects. Also, majority of midterm and final summative assessments in secondary schools are mostly multiple choice questions. Although there are some essay writing or project-based assessments, but they are not that critical for getting higher grade since they are perceived as like formative assessments rather than summative assessments. Indeed, Korean public education rule explicitly states that there are two types of assessments in K-12 schools. One is paper and pencil test with multiple choice questions, which is perceived as a summative assessment, critical for grading, of course. And the other one is other activities like projects, portfolio, essay writing, et cetera, which are not that critical for grading. So we are going to propose a change of the assessment regulation in the K-12 education administration rule 
by switching the test form of the formative assessments and the summative assessments. That is, uh, we are going to uh, propose assessing projects and essay writings, various activities as summatives and multiple choice questions as formatives using AI. For receptive learning to assess understanding, remembering, AI could easily greatly contribute to replace teachers or tutors role providing personalized feedback for mastery learning. So by changing the assessment form of the formatives and the summatives, we are expecting to encourage and accelerate the assessment paradigm shift. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you all panelists for the great discussion. I really, uh, really liked it. Um, now, but now it's time to come to a conclusion. And I'd like to say that the, the true role of assessment is to visualize performance, which motivates students while giving guidance to teachers should not be a public judgment of a student's worth. We already have proven technology to repurpose assessment and make it more natural and formative. So what we, what we need now is effective adaptation of AI technology while building solid social consensus on the next paradigm of assessment once again, thank you, thank you, and thank you for watching uh, this uh, panel discussion. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye now.